I'm Cindy Cornell, the career coach for working professionals. And today we're going to speak about powerful storytelling. Thanks so much for joining us. Again, powerful storytelling. I think about stories, I think about um, as a child, um, hearing once upon a time and being captivated and leaning in and really being excited about what's coming next and curious about what's coming next. And uh, I think we're naturally wired to be excited about really cool stories. And I think we're also really naturally wired to tell great stories. Um, we sometimes get in our own way. So hopefully in this session, um, we will get you set up to um, engage people and differentiate yourselves in, um, in ways that are um, improving what you've been doing regularly or most recently. So we'll get started now. It looks like uh, we've got a pretty solid number of, of participants. Um, it's early here on the East Coast today. Um, and I think I do see a couple of uh, folks coming in from Asia, which is exciting. And, um, and I know that a couple of our West Coast friends are looking forward to catching this on recording. So um, please look out for this on uh, the alumni relations, uh, uh, the alumni career portal under career resources. It will be posted um, in just a couple of days as a recording as well, if you'd like to watch it again or share it with any of your uh, friends or colleagues. Um, so while we're here today, please focus on our time together. Um, it's just an hour. We'll try to end at a few minutes before uh, the top of the hour. And everybody's muted. Um, we'll try to manage most of our Q&A and questions through chat and Q&A. And if there's anything here that doesn't actually get covered that you want to talk about, please um, feel free to reach out to me by making a coaching appointment. So today's agenda. Uh, we're first going to talk about why storytelling matters. And then we'll get into some best practices. Um, that you can actually then put into your own personal practice. And uh, we'll also um, then share a few wrap, you know, few wrap up points and resources and then move into Q&A. So I have dis, uh, by design uh, left quite a bit of time at the end for Q&A. So hopefully we've got a robust uh, conversation there. Um, again, the resources um, that we're talking about, we'll talk about a little bit later, but this, this webinar will be um, posted under Alumni Career Resources. So by the end of today, I am hoping that you're more aware of everyday stories and perhaps we'll have dispelled a few myths that you have around storytelling. You'll have a few new best practices and you might even have a short list of some personal and professional stories that you'd like to work on. So first of all, I wanna just remind you that stories are ubiquitous, they are everywhere. And it's really how we convey um, powerful ideas and it's how the brain is wired to remember things. So before we get started, just think of a couple of stories that you might've heard recently. Um, the stories you've told yourself perhaps. Um, stories are coming at us in Twitter. Those are little, you know, kind of br really brief stories. And um, we've got, you know, our Facebook posts and other social media, Instagram, some of those stories are pictures and some of those stories are words, um, but they are sharing um, elements of culture and elements of our personal brands um, and our ideas. And um, again, they're, they're, they're speaking to who we are each time we, we see them. Um, some stories are really simple. I'm not good at remembering names is actually a story because I am positive that you are really good at remembering a whole bunch of people's names. So, that's just a story. I maybe aren't, haven't remembered that person's name yet, just a story. Um, some stories are a lot more complicated. We certainly have a lot of complicated stories going on in our world today, um, global, sociological, epidemiological. Um, there's a lot of complicated stories. Um, and you know, this is just, again, for us to think about where are they and, and which ones are you drawn to and which ones kind of put you off a bit more. Um, Stories draw us together or not. We see a lot of that in terms of um, political divisiveness, for example. Um, so as we talk about stories, I'm talking about them from the affirmative. I'm talking about them from the perspective of those that do create strong connection. Um, those stories are going to be repeatable. They're going to be memorable. So if we think about this in a professional way, as we're thinking about um, getting new jobs, for example, we want to be con conscious of the fact that people might need to make our uh, referral to others and they would therefore want to remember and be, be able to share salient points um, in, in resonant ways. 
Um, the language is resonant. It sounds like them. It is understandable by them. Um, a funny story, as I think about coffee this morning, um, I was in the UK some years ago, and one of my business colleagues wasn't able to order coffee in the UK because they asked her black or white, and she didn't know what, she want, what they were talking about. She, in fact, wanted white coffee. She wanted it with cream, but she hadn't actually done that translation yet, so it wasn't resonant or accessible. I want you guys to think about that in terms of stories, um, in terms of how you use um, examples or metaphor. Um, stories can be emotional. They can you know, transport you and, and engage you in different ways. And when we engage our emotions, those are, those are memorable. Um, they demonstrate uh, empathy. So we can show people that we know who we're talking to by how carefully we've constructed our stories. And they're also really important to, to share consistently in themes over time and space. This is really important as we think about social media and the fact that we might actually not be broadcasting consistent stories and messaging across all channels. That can be a problem where it creates um, cognitive dissonance and, and um, confusion to our reader or to our listener or to our audience uh, because they're not really sure who you are. They think they know, but, but if they're not sure, that creates, um, from a perspective of cognitive neuroscience, creates threat in the brain. It creates an emotional um, risk state and it breaks trust and it's harder to connect there. So um, again, think about uh, how to create stories that are tailored um, and they are understood by or can connect what they already know um, in ways that they're able to synthesize some new, some new ideas into um, what they're already comfortable with. Stories are everywhere. They have great power. Um, this is a wonderful book by one of our famous professors, and um, he speaks about the fact that um, the human brain tends to, and I mentioned this already, organize thoughts around metaphor. So this is really kind of thinking about images, connecting things we already know with other things we already know. Um, and that just helps us to, um, to understand and remember. And the brain also seeks out things that are familiar. So if you can connect a new idea to something that's already quite comfortable, um, it's much more easy to remember it and to, um, to adopt it. Um, the brain um, seeks out what's familiar and um, it will align with that long, you know, those long held beliefs, true or not. So this is really important as we think about things that go viral. Um, it may not actually be true. It may just be something that you've heard over and over again and it feels familiar. So that's something to be, to, to notice about stories as we, observe them in our everyday. Uh, and um, just again, thinking about that idea of threat state, it's hard to connect when somebody's feeling threatened. Um, that's just the brain is gonna, you know, kind of put all the blood into the limbic system um, and the amygdala, we're gonna be in fight flight and, you know, higher level reasoning happens in the prefrontal cortex and you can't have blood pooling in both parts of the brain at the same time, it's gonna go either here or up here. So again, we wanna kind of have people be in a comfortable toward state when you're sharing your stories. Um, this is a reason why understanding what could be potential objections in job interviews is so important. So you can proactively overcome them and people are feeling much more comfortable with who you are and what you might be presenting. So thinking about stories, you know, in all of our, you know, all, you know, across all of our lives, sometimes it's persuading people at work. Sometimes it's, um, it's the job interview or, or something else. So, um, really just to understand sometimes it's negotiating with your with your children i have a um a 14 year old almost he's going to be 14 next week and we're talking about um you know kind of stories all, all day long in terms of you know how we each perceive things and um trying to persuade each other to different ideas and um to live harmoniously and kind of share information that we remember and can act upon so um what gets in the way sometimes of stories um, I love this, this idea that we are all born to speak and we all started our life out, you know, speaking loudly and letting, letting people know we were there and we had something to say and it was important. And over time, we tend to judge ourselves or allow ourselves to feel judged. Um, and we don't necessarily speak what's important. Um, or we don't take the time to figure out, you know, kind of how do we speak what's important in ways that other people are going to be excited about listening. Um, let me just check in with you and see if anybody wants to share now. Um, you can put this in the chat box. 
what do you think gets in your in the way of storytelling? You can also kind of just make this note for yourself personally, so you can explore this. Um, what gets in the way of your of strong storytelling in writing or or verbally? Something to to contemplate. Speaking quietly is not a natural behavior. It's learned. So fear of messing up. You know, the story, I'm not a good storyteller is a story. Um, I have not, I, I don't have anything important to say. Um, I'm not comfortable in front of an audience. I don't know what they need or what they're interested in. Um, some people are born storytellers. That's not me. Um, and then there's also this idea of, well, you know, I'll share everything and they'll pick out what they need. Um, those are all stories about why we're not good storytellers or why we don't jump in. Um, you maybe have that as being an objection or a barrier, but it's, it's not that you can't do it. It's just that you haven't mastered that yet. So, um, and in terms of the fear of messing up, well, hopefully some of the, pra the best practices that we share in just a few minutes um, will help you to start to think about how to prepare in ways that you feel you do feel really comfortable with with storytelling and, and putting your message out there and taking that risk because it is a risk socially we're putting ourselves out there and we might be rejected um, i would encourage you to say oh please tell me more what's not working um, as opposed to not uh, sharing because you think they might not like it um, let's put it out there and see what we can learn from that that experience if if um, if we can so moving out of you know kind of why it matters and moving into um, how to do it um, really effectively. Um, anytime you get into a place where you're getting, you're preparing to tell a story, I want you to start with the end in mind. Uh, why am I telling the story? What's important here? Um, run the race, if you will. Imagine yourself winning before you've started going around the track. Having this idea of perspective hindsight is really helpful. Um, and if you get off track at some point, it's useful having rehearsed it and having some structure around it um, in terms of um, your summarized main points for yourself and for your audience. You can actually go back through and say, okay, hurdle one, hurdle two, hurdle three, and then hurdle four, then finish. Those are your um, finish strong. Those are your, those are your bullet points or your main themes. So if you get off track, you can say, okay, I've done hurdle one so far and hurdle two. And... Next, we're gonna go do, and you're remembering hurdle three and then hurdle four. So it's a, the structure is useful and memorizing or imagining, visualizing success is gonna be helpful to you in achieving success. So um, this, this image, do you have a vision for what people after you have your conversation with them, after you share your story, a big story or a small story, um, what is it that they're going to know? What is it that they will believe? How are they going to feel? That's gonna help you choose the right language. And then finally, what will they be prepared to do after having heard your story but that perhaps they weren't prepared to do at the start? Many different reasons to tell stories. Again, start with the end in mind to know why you're having the conversation and align it with your vision for wild success. Really important also in terms of a best practice to know your audience. You're gonna to wanna to research and figure out who are they? What do they care about? Um, you're not going to share everything that you could possibly share. You're gonna share very selectively according to what they hope that you might do for them in the future. It really has to speak to um, that idea. Uh, and I want you to think about um, what they might be curious about. So you're sharing things in a way that they say, tell me more about that. And that inspires a dialogue. Again, a story, if it's truly engaging, is two ways. Um, I think about the movie that has been most popular since I think the 19, late 1980s, um, The Princess Bride. It's a story being told by a grandfather to a grandson. And at several points during the, during the movie, it shows the grandfather and the grandson talking about the story. So there's some engagement, it's not just one way. And, and I think that's pretty important in all of our stories. So think about how we, um, bring that experience together. Um, you might want to think about if you're not sure who you're talking to specifically, if you're preparing for an interview or uh, preparing a resume perhaps for um, a, a, a job search, think about creating an avatar. 
who is this person? What are they talking about? What are they worried about? Um, what else might be on their dashboard? What are their values? What's keeping them up at night? And by thinking about this, you can come up with really salient examples that will draw them in, that they'll be excited to learn more about. If you are talking for yourself and not talk and for ego and not talking out of service and in, with an intent to be useful to this other person, you're likely not going to be heard um, and the story is likely not well, not going to land as well as if you'd taken the time to really do this research. Um, where, to, where to do the research? Lots of places. We can go to social media. Um, we can look at their website. We can look at you know, their About Us section. Um, we can read what analyst reports have said about the company to kind of understand what their uh, biggest challenges might be. Um, we can think about networking with um, current and former employees. Um, and a hint here I have, and I share with folks often, is you don't always want to start at the top. Sometimes you might want to start with a lower level employee so you can build up your knowledge so that when you do have the opportunity in the audience with the more senior employee or the hiring manager, you're really well spoken about what they would care about and you're able to tailor your story, your conversation better there. Um, so know your audience is, is a best practice to practice. Um, I also want to um, dispel the myth that you're ever going to be complete or done with a story unless you're, um, you're uh, only ever spe speaking to one person, um, you are always going to need to tailor the story to your audience. So um, one version um, is if you're saying, oh, it's ready for prime time, it's ready for that person, that company, it's not necessarily ready for everybody. Slight tweaks will make it much more resonant. Um, if you have gaps, if you have some spaces in your resume that don't directly speak to the company or the role or the, that, that aren't, you, you don't think as persuasive about um, why you'd be good at something as, um, as direct experience, I still want you to dive in there and own it and talk about why you did it, how you grew, and how that sets you up better to be prepared to, to take on whatever you're taking on next. What did you focus on? Um, how did you learn? And sometimes we have um, gaps caused by things that we're not excited about. We might have been caught up in a layoff associated with perhaps a global pandemic. Lots of other people have experienced that too. You're not alone. So please don't let your anxiety about something, that's your story in your head about something, please don't let that become their story about you. So we really do want to kind of figure out and own this and, and uh, think about how we do want to share it in a, in a positive light. And I have talked about um, in prior webinars, I think um, most notably uh, reimagining your career in 2020, um, about some things you can do if you've got a gap. Um, and how you can how you can maneuver through that. Um, some people are stay-at-home parents. Um, they're working from home. They work for themselves. Why did you do that? And 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 how is that important? Um, how is that part of a compelling professional story? Um, do you own it or do you minimize it? If you minimize it, you're missing a couple of really important opportunities to um, showcase who you are and your values and and why you'd be a great asset to that team. Another hint to write well: read. I want you to think about who you can follow, um, what's going on. This is a, a late addition to my presentation. This was a, a, a LinkedIn post I saw um, just, I think it was on Thursday or Friday. And um, I loved what it had to say. Um, this particular storyteller um, who also has a really great YouTube video um, called the, Bi is the Bicycle Guy. Um, he engages folks um, through story and he wants to help you to say things like, I'm not, not that I'm passionate about something, but to really, um, really dive in. I see somebody is excited because Neil was their professor um, at INSEAD. Um, so that's awesome. So you can actually, um, yeah, share with your friends uh, a little bit more about what, uh, what I'm talking about here. Um, you want to show people why you're good at something. Um, you want to really be thoughtful about um, how and why you've set yourself up to be successful here. Um, passion doesn't really mean a whole lot. And those people that kind of put yourself out there and say, I'm passionate, um, isn't, um, isn't telling them something that's going to differentiate you and it's not going to make you memorable. What was the last time if you were, if you were interviewing for somebody that um, 
you said, oh, we should hire them. They're really passionate. I suspect you've probably never said that. So I don't suspect that other people are going to say that about you. So you want to think about what is it that you can say that is going to be really exciting um, and memorable and resonant to them in their language. Um, what stories engage you? What stories are really interesting to you? And again, this is something you can observe in your day-to-day -day meetings um, or interactions. Um, even on our Zoom meetings, we can tell when people are really attentive um, to the conversation that's going on and when they might be doing something else, checking their phones, um, whatever else it might be doing, but they're not necessarily actively engaged. So what are the triggers and things like that and why might people be engaged or not engaged? Again, this is just a great opportunity for you to observe um, people who are able to uh, really uh, support that kind of rapt attention and those who maybe haven't really tweaked that messaging to be resonant and exciting to, uh, to their audience. Um, the other thing that you can do, and I do this a little bit right now on purpose at this place is droning on and on. Because if you say the same thing over and over again and you're not adding anything new, snooze, right? People are gonna, they're gonna tune out until something else does come up that really is attractive to them. So we wanna hook people, <clears throat> pardon me. We wanna think about um, what is it that we can put out there right up front that's gonna be head, uh, compelling to them? What's, what's the headline um, or what's the bullet point if we're talking about a resume that's gonna leave somebody wanting more where they're gonna say, that's cool, we need that, tell me more. You're really, again, leaving your space open for dialogue so your audience can participate in the story with you. Again, this is about building connection, not about you being smart or um, entertaining and those types of things. We're not talking about, you know, kind of stand-up comedy or, uh, or something like that where it's intended to be much more one way. Um, it's intended to be um, a dialogue, fostering dialogue for you. Um, the other point I mentioned earlier is, again, resonance. You sound like me. That builds trust. There's a song that many of you may know um, called The Hook by Blues Traveler. And it was a really popular song when it came out. And if you get a chance at some point, go back and read the lyrics because it talks about it doesn't matter what I say if I say it with inflection. Um, and this whole idea of um, the cadence and the, the, the framing of the language um, so the language is pretty genius in terms of talking about getting people's and, and keeping people's attention. But what many people don't know is that underneath the, um, the, the music in that particular song, it is based on Pachelbel's canon, which is really familiar to a lot of us. So before we heard the song for the first time, it was already in a way familiar to us. That's the kind of, you know, I don't want to call it a trick, but that's the kind of technique you want to use where you're sharing perhaps elements of what you've done in your past with the way the company or the people that you're talking to understand it so that they see you as being part of their team, part of their, their, their crowd. Um, I see a, um, a question that's come through. Can I give some um, examples of hooks and resumes or interviews? Um, I'll get to that in just a story, in just a moment. Um, but, but first, I just want to kind of give you these kind of three cardinal rules. I want you to be really intentional in your communications. I want you to be consistent. Again, inconsistency is confusing and it can break trust. And I want you to also be generous. Again, thinking about what's the language that would be most resonant with your audience and which elements of the story do you want to focus on for this person versus that person based on what their different and unique needs might be? So um, your frame is going to, and that structure, we talked about structure a little while ago as well is, is, is really important. We'll talk about that in a few moments as well in terms of some different ways to create more structure for yourself. But um, think about the frame. Going right back into a resume short story, right? Uh, right into the question that just came through. Um, I'm sharing here um, the language that I, I share with folks in terms of, the, of an example. This is 50 words, and I'm labeling it here as a resume short story. It's really um, guidance uh, for your resume summary statement if you choose to use one. Um, we, we are trying to leverage our previous skills uniquely in a new role 
or an industry. And we want to create this context for our reader, highlighting in a brief way, um, enough to kind of get them to say, I think there's something here. I want to take some more time with this resume, with this person. I want to get to know them a little bit more. 50 words or fewer, the intersection of your prior experience with what you'd like to do in the future. I can remember the, the visual I shared a little while ago of the two intersecting circles. It's not everything you've ever done and everything that you will do in the future. It's that beautiful intersection between what you have done and how you will leverage that into what they care about. Um, and it's not everything that you could do in the future. It's the pieces that they care about right now. So hopefully this is, this is useful to, um, to share here. I don't have um, a specific example for any specific resume to share because again, it's all going to be bespoke. It's going to be tailored to a specific job uh, posting. And um, that's just a hint if you're ever getting in, um, uh, getting into a coaching conversation with me, if you're sharing a resume and you want my feedback, I really encourage you to share with me uh, both your resume and the job description because I have no idea of knowing if it's a good job description or if it's a good resume if I don't know what it's for or who it's for. And I might ask you a bunch of questions about the job because what I've found in my experience is many job descriptions, and you might know this too, are very poorly written by people who haven't done the job. So there's a lot of important elements in terms of skills and outcomes and relationships that may not be in the job description that we would want to, if we're really putting ourselves out there as being effective uh, candidates for a role, for example, or if we are um, um, pitching a piece of business, why is our company better or you know, better differentiated or prepared to, to help your company than anyone else? Um, super important. Um, to uh, be in that, you know, very specific space. And again, if everybody else is kind of saying, yep, I can do that. Yep, I can do that. Yep, I can do that. And they haven't taken the time to really get into and understand how does this job add value, create value in um, the global business? Um, you're going to shine and they're going to be, you know, kind of those other resumes on the pile that maybe didn't get looked at. So, um, your um, summary statement in a resume would create context. It's future focused. Um, it's succinct. Um, it's very specific. It's not sharing everything again. It's um, just creating that space of connection. And um, you really, again, want to make sure that it's focused on and aligned with your audience's interests and needs. Uh, we're articulating your offer. This is you know, something that I put out there for folks also. When you're looking for a new opportunity, you're not open to everybody. If you're selling your, your own firm's products, not everybody is your best customer. You want to have a story that's resonant to your ideal customer so they can actually self-select in. So I mentioned before, again, um, structure sets you free. These are a couple of different ways you could organize your story. Um, and again, think about this, it's not a whole story that's uh, memorized from beginning to end because you do want it to be aligned with some or to, to allow for or encourage some dialogue. Um, so um, again, why are we worried about this? It's um, supported by research that when we use structure to share information, it's, it's uh, understood and um, recalled 40% more reliably and accurately than information that is shared in an unstructured way. Um, and uh, this particular statistic came from a book that the EMBA program uses in one of their development sessions um, for students that they can opt into. Um, the book is called um, From Speaking Up Without Freaking Out. And it's not just sharing, um, it's by Matt Abram, Abrahams. It's not just sharing um, ideas around structuring your messaging, but also how to prepare if you're a little anxious about getting on camera or making a presentation or getting in for an interview or whatever else it might be. So um, those are some, that's a suggestion um, that you could peek at. So again, when you have the structure and you lose your way, you can go back and say, okay, we talked about the past and we talked about the present. We're going to finish the present and then move into the future. It's kind of a, a, a reminder for yourself, especially if you are in dialogue and you, um, you maybe get distracted by something that, that uh, your audience has shared. So um, moving again through um, another best practice, um, the moral of the story. 
I want you to, again, to start with the end in mind, repeat what's important, create themes. If we're talking about a resume, uh, people's eyes skip around. So if you want them to, I, so many times I, can, I can't tell you how often this happens when people say, oh, I discussed that in bullet point four. Well, they might not get to bullet point four or they might only read the first two or they might skip, uh, skip around. So for those three to five themes, that you want people to remember about you or remember about your story, you wanna say them a couple of different times in a couple of different ways. And again, marketing research would tell you, for example, with branding, it takes at least three impressions for people to remember a brand. Same type of idea goes here with, with stories and major themes you want folks to recall. Spark their curiosity. You know, you want them to lean in and, and, and say, tell me more. Um, getting close to wrapping up here. In practicing your story, you begin to know yourself. I can't tell you how often I have conversations with folks that come in for coaching and they're not really sure what they want. And it's by beginning to ask some of these questions, by thinking about what your values are, by thinking about um, what's important to you, what in your past has given you energy, What's drained your energy? What types of personalities aren't um, exciting or fun for you to work for? That's really helpful for people to begin to know. And um, I encourage you to write things down because we remember things differently and we relate with information differently when we just think it versus when we scribe. Um, it becomes much more kinesthetic and physiological. In terms of, in terms of, um, you know, becoming comfortable with storytelling, we practice. And again, if you do um, more reading and um, explore more around storytelling, you'll find that a lot of stories, um, it, it takes some time to get them distilled down to something that is worth sharing. Um, I used to teach uh, a course at um, NYU and I would ask my students to submit a half page on a compelling case for something. And often people would look at me and they would say, I can't possibly share a half page. This is too big a topic. I said, I know it's a big topic. I didn't ask you to write a half page. I asked you to submit a half page. I fully expect that you're going to have to take some time in writing a lot of things to really sift through and figure out what are the most important salient points that you want to have come through strongly and that would be similar to what you might be doing in personal or professional storytelling where you're putting that most exciting stuff out first and then we're engaging in dialogue to get into the deeper elements um, as is appropriate by the audience's interest. So um, the other thing, practice, 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 share your stories, um, check in with people. Um, I highly encourage you when you're um, getting ready to, if it's a written story, speak it aloud make sure it actually sounds authentic because if it's inauthentic it could create some dissonance with your audience and, and you don't want to do that you want to be in that forward um, trust building space and you know another um uh great uh space to kind of sp uh hang out in here is uh, is ted talks for example or there's a great book called um talk like ted um, i actually listened to that online and ted talks if we recall are 18 minutes or shorter, um, brief conversations that are in, indeed meant to be engaging. So um, lots of resources like that out there um, for you to, to observe and practice and, um, and, uh, and grow, right? To get some new ideas. And for the ones that aren't so great, you can learn from those too. What wasn't working and you wanna make sure that you don't do those things. So I'm getting, um, getting ready here to kind of wrap up. I'm curious, though, and we can do a little bit more chat box check in here. Um, what stories are you thinking about wanting to maybe work on and craft for yourself? Um, if anyone wants to share, oftentimes making something public is um, a sign of commitment and it might inspire you to um, move a little bit farther faster on, on, those, pro on those projects. So um, do you all have really thoughtful and this is a little story, um, really thoughtful LinkedIn headlines. Um, do you have a thoughtful story in your LinkedIn bio, in your about section? Um, do you have a 
um, a brief thoughtful story uh, that might be um, your uh, summary statement for your resume. These are just some examples of, of brief stories. Um, do you have a story maybe that you've said over and over in your, how, in your head um, where I'm not good at, where you might want to play with and uh, see how can I counter that? Is that really true? What evidence exists to support that? Again, I used the example earlier, I'm not good at names. I'm betting that you know most people's names. So you are good. It's just that you haven't memorized everybody's names yet. So these are, these are stories. Some are big, some are little, some are public, some are in our heads um, that we might want to work on. So hopefully you're making some mental notes about those things. Um, and uh, I do hope that we're, um, we're kind of uh, wrapping up here with the content. So would love to see a couple more questions if, if questions come in. Um, to be able to you know, be in dialogue with you um, on that. And I also know it's early for many of you. So if you're not ready for that, that's fine too. Um, so going back and revisiting, again, structure, um, what we said we were going to do. I talked about um, helping you to become more aware of everyday stories. Talked about a few myths that might exist around storytelling. Um, and you guys were great in sharing a couple here today in the session. So thank you for that. Wanted to share a couple of best practices um, that you might want to be aware of um, and to begin to practice. And, um, and then to uh, make a, a, a brief list of uh, personal or professional stories that you might want to work on. So hopefully you're comfortable that we've, we've accomplished that. Um, as I'm waiting for a couple more questions to come in, I just wanted to remind you that resources for SOM working professionals are found on the alumni website um, under career resources. And this is just a quick, quick screenshot of the first few things that would show up on the page. So this webinar will show up in the alumni relations CDO webinar uh, in just a couple of days. And um, there are other webinars that I've done, for example, with our MBA for executive students that are showing up in the other webinars. So there's some content in there about bullet points and branding um, that you could peek at as well. That would be useful for everyone. And um, again, check back regularly because uh, we do try to um, keep things fresh. And um, if there's something that you're looking for that's not on the resources here, again, don't hesitate to reach out and ask. So, um, Questions. I'm open for you guys to share whatever's going on for you. Um, and I'm just going through here and seeing what's coming through. Um, I'm intrigued by a story in your LinkedIn. Uh, let's see. Let's, uh, I like your. Oh, there's a bunch here. Okay, let's see. Um, in an interview, am, am I correct in assuming that sh stories should not be longer than 90 seconds? Um, again, I think this is a really good point. If you're trying to engage in a dialogue or in conversation, uh, you want to be aware of the ability for the other person to uh, respond or check in. So uh, you want to do take things into bite-sized pieces. I say to my, um, my son all the time, you can't eat a steak in one bite. So how do we actually frame it in ways that um, are, are palatable to our audience? So I do think that those bite-sized pieces are, are, are compelling. And when you do that, it gives the audience an opportunity to respond to you. So you're able to um, tailor your response to the things that they're most attracted to, most intrigued by. You will have an idea of that before you get into the interview, but that, that back and forth is trust building and rapport building and really important if you are, um, are in a new relationship and, um, and incredibly helpful. So again, the shorter stories um, will provide you with um, that, that opportunity to do more tailoring real time. Um, uh, there's a question here about um, linking the idea of storytelling and connecting that to LinkedIn. Um, there are some great um, LinkedIn profiles out there. You can check out um, different people that have gone to SOM. Um, there's a wonderful um, LinkedIn course that we recommend on the career resources, um, landing the perfect job with LinkedIn. It not only tells you um, some hints for and what, is, what are considered best practices there, uh, but also um, it talks about how to use LinkedIn to do research, um, really powerful research as well. 
um, using the recruiter function, what recruiters are looking for, and using things like the university tool. Um, so um, I'd check out that resource on like, about LinkedIn. And then um, if you want to have a coaching conversation with me about your LinkedIn profile and making sure that we're really optimizing that to what you're trying to attract in terms of future opportunities, even if you're not looking for a job right now, this is really important because uh, oftentimes some of the coolest opportunities, some of the coolest you know, referrals come when you're not looking. So being really thoughtful about and sharing your, um, you know, what your values are and what your interests are out there um, that you'd like to share uh, is, is, is super helpful to having the right opportunities come into you um, when you are looking. So, um, so please don't wait to kind of refresh your LinkedIn profile, um, even if you're happy in your, in your current role. Um, example, um, somebody asked about examples of uh, you know, stories in LinkedIn profiles. Um, I, um, I'm a sailor. Um, I don't know if you noticed in the, uh, in the photograph of narrative economics um, that I shared earlier, um, there were sailboats in the background. So that just happened to be what I was reading while I was uh, watching a friend sail um, recently. And um, I, have an ex I have a story on my LinkedIn profile about sailing. And it is a story, it shows me, it's actually, um, it speaks to the photograph I have in my cover photo. And I'm sitting on the rail of a racing yacht. Here's in a ponytail, glasses, hat. Um, and I'm not doing anything other than my weight is where the boat needs me um, to make sure that we're healed properly. And I talk about the fact that sometimes sailing is about sitting quietly where you're, needing, where you're needed. And sometimes it's really busy and there's a lot going on and you have to be aware of your job and you have to work together with the rest of the people on the team. And, um, and if you don't do your job and if you can't be depended on, um, bad things can happen. So it's a little story. Um, it gives people an idea about who I am and what I might like to do in, the, in my free time. It's an opportunity and a point of connection. Um, I uh, was on a conversation in a conversation with a recruiter earlier this year, and it was super cool to find out that she also loves to sail. And where did she sail and those types of things. So putting things out there like that are more opportunities for people to connect and say, oh, you're like me. We have similar things in common. So it's not just professional stuff that matters. So hopefully that example um, will help a little bit. Uh, there's a couple of other um, LinkedIn profiles that I've read recently that I really uh, I'm intrigued by and, and drawn to um, talking about where leadership comes from and what inspired their, their particular style or what inspired certain interests. Um, and I mentioned the bicycle guy video earlier. Um, that's a little story talking about um, in this particular case, why private equity? And it links back to something that this person did as a child. And that would be memorable and help that person to come higher up into the list if there's a lot of different opportunities for, for different, um, different ind individuals to, um, that, they're, uh, that they're interviewing. You know, which one are you gonna remember? You're gonna remember the one with the cool story, um, not necessarily the one, again, as I said earlier, that says I'm passionate about this. So I just love it, I've always loved it. That doesn't really, you're, you're telling me something, but I have no evidence. You're not showing me anything in a way that I'm feeling connected or it's believable. Um, let's see. Um, how many stories do you recommend telling in an interview? This is my famous graduate school answer. Um, you guys have all finished graduate school, so you don't necessarily need to use it, but I said you'll never be wrong if you say it depends. So how many stories do you recommend telling in an interview? It depends. Um, I want you to be prepared with lots of stories. Um, I want you to have really thoughtfully gone through the job description and, um, and looking at what's written there, what's told there, what's, cause that's, that's a story too. Um, it may not be complete. So you're, you're maybe gonna have to fill in some of the blanks. Um, many times job descriptions don't, for example, talk about who are the most important partners? Um, who are my business partners internally or externally? And if you haven't thought about that, you're not necessarily going to share some stories that would show people that you'd be really good at um, creating trust and rapport with those, those people that you would um, be seen as competent and respected by those folks. And that could really make a difference in terms of whether or not you'd be, you know, the, the, high, the, the highest um, uh, qualified candidate for the role. So um, how many stories? It depends. And it's not, again, about having rehearsed stories. It's about being able to share conversationally 
um, relative to what that audience is looking for. So um, when people come in for coaching, getting ready for interviews, they usually leave with not just the practice, but also a lot more questions and a lot more research to do so that they are ready to answer those questions authentically um, and sharing, you know, kind of really relevant experience from their past, usually in ways that they haven't articulated it before. I didn't share this so articulately or, or clearly today. The stories that we want to tell people in the future are not so much about what we did then, unless we've translated it into a way that they can actually imagine themselves in the story with us. If we go to the movies and we, um, you know, kind of gasp when things happen or we, we jump or we're excited or otherwise, um, in, you know, differently engaged, it's because of suspension of disbelief, right? Like I'm in it with them. <gasps> you know, it's, that's, that's kind of what you want to try to do with your stories. So if you're telling them a story about something that's really specific about a prior industry that has nothing to do with what you'd ever do with them, you need to translate it. So it can't be about that thing that you did. It has to be much more about how you problem solved and what some of the, what some of the um, characteristics of the problem were like. So they could actually see you and say, oh, we have complicated problems. Oh, I really, I'm really feeling comfortable that Cindy could help us through with some of those challenges. So um, how, many, how many stories, you know, it, it really does depend. Um, let's see, I'm looking at some other questions here. Um, what do you do when you're telling your story and you see that, you see that your, your audience is fading out? Um, I, would, I would check in with them. I would be really thoughtful about that and say, I'm curious, um, you know, what of what I've shared with you so far has, have you found most useful or most, most, uh, most important for success in this role? Or I'm curious, is there anything that we haven't talked about here that you'd like to discuss that would, that would help you to understand my role a little bit more? Um, that's a question I, or, or my, my ability to, to be successful here in, an, in uh, another, in, uh, that would help me to be successful here in this role. Um, I want to be careful in the framing of that because I didn't frame that one as well as I could have. I don't want it to be a yes, no question because if they say no, then the interview's over. Um, if they're fading out, you want to ask a question that's going to inspire an answer that can actually re-engage re dialogue. So um, I definitely would check in and not keep talking, uh, not keep going on about what you've just been talking about because something, something's happened. Um, so um, that's a suggestion. And if you have um, more specific questions about that, or if you want to kind of play with that or role play that, um, at some point, again, I'm happy to kind of play with you with that in a coaching conversation. Um, there's another uh, question just asking, will this be available, this recording? Yes, it will be available for later viewing. Um, so um, again, check out the, um, the career resources page on the alumni portal, and this will be up in, in just a day or two. Um, and you'll also receive the, um, you'll also receive the, uh, the slides when the, um, when the recording goes out. Um, if you've been registered for this webinar, um, you'll get an email about that. Um, let's see, other questions. This is a good one. Somebody said, coaching, what are the fees? Actually, as an alum of SOM, you have access to career coaching through the Career Development Office um, at no charge. So uh, you just have to go to the career, uh, the career page on the alumni portal and you scroll down, there's a little video that talks about coaching. And then underneath that, there's a, 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 a bit on career resources. And then below that, it's um, about booking an appointment through our career management system, CMS. And, um, the brief, uh, their brief, um, you know, kind of 30 minute coaching conversations, um, though um, you can have a couple if there's something that you're, you're working on over time. Um, so that is, um, that is um, that one. Um, there's a question to go back to the resources page. So let me go back there so you guys can see that again. And that just gives you an idea. And this is just the top of the list of resources. There's a bunch of other things there too, but I just wanted to kind of remind you of what, what was there. Um, let's see a couple more questions. Um, starting a company, let's see. 
that has various stakeholders. Um, it's not easy to create an overriding story. Uh, okay, if you're starting a company that has various stakeholders, not easy to create an overriding story because parts of the business speak to different people. Um, how do we consolidate the situation? For anybody who's taken the integrated curriculum at SOM, this is, this is that question. Uh, we really want to step back and think about um, this from the executive level, um, from the CEO level, from the leader level. Um, a leader is coordinating across a variety of stakeholders. So um, there are going to be some themes that are resonant and true for everybody. Um, how we translate that you know, to accounting versus sales versus R&D versus customers is going to be different. Um, but that's, I mean, that's really the thing that we want to kind of think about is um, what are the themes? What are, what's the mission? What are the values of the organization? Um, and then how is it that we actually create some intersection where everybody, you know, there's, there's the overlap where people can see that, um, that this, this company is for them, even if you're talking to um, a larger group. Now, again, you're going to speak to um, even accounting, which is historically kind of looking backwards and finance, which is historically looking forwards, there's that intersection where they're looking at, you know, actual data and, and modeling. That's, that's an over, you know, that's the, the overlap. So um, that's, you know, how I really think about the overriding story. It's what's true for everybody and, and how do we put that out there? And then we make slight translations um, for, um, for, the, for the different stakeholder groups. Um, again, if you are in that space and you are starting a company and you want some help challenging you in building that, um, again, I'm happy to have a conversation with you to help you to begin to think through that. Um, but what I do before you came is to you know, really identify those stakeholders, think about what do they care about, what's important to each of them, and then that might help you, again, getting it out of your head and onto paper um, some ideas might actually begin to come to you before you even get on the get on the phone with me or get on a Zoom uh, coaching conversation with me. Um, let's see, a couple more questions, and we're coming up to the top of the hour, so I want to wrap up here in a moment. Um, how do you deliver an answer to an interview question where you are having a dialogue? Do you pose questions? I'm a little um, I'm a little uh, confused on this point. Um, when we are in an interview and the the uh, the interviewer is responding to something that we said i'm totally okay with you asking questions because how are you going to tailor what you're going to say next if you don't know what they're most interested in so um, it really is you know no different than another kind of conversation where you're seeking to learn um, from one another it's a little bit like dating you want to kind of not seduce people and tell them oh i'm great for all of these reasons and you know let me try to convince you you're wanting to kind of find where, where those places of mutual attraction and um, you're not going to kind of figure it all out in one meeting. It's going to take a couple meetings. So you want to build that trust and rapport and curiosity so that they ask for another meeting and say, I'd like to, I'd like to get to know you a little bit more. Let's go on a second date or a third date. So um, really to think about it as, as not distinctly different than other conversations where you're meeting people and developing rapport um, for the first time. Um, any ideas or frameworks on storytelling to describe addressing a weakness and addressing that? Um, I'm a big fan of, of knowing what your strengths are. And I actually also believe that um, often weaknesses are overused strengths. Um, as an example, my undergraduate degree, believe it or not, is accounting. And, um, and I did my MBA in finance and marketing. And, um, when you think about accounting, you think about detail orientation being really important. And it is, and you need that. However, overused detail orientation is micromanagement. And that's, you know, kind of, it's, it's, it's the, the lack of appropriate calibration for something that would otherwise be seen as a strength. So we want to be really aware of our strengths. And we then also want to see what could be perceived, and I talked about this earlier in the presentation, as a weakness or, or an objection in our uh, in our candidacy for a particular role or an opportunity and figure out how do we overcome that? What other skills do we have or what proxy experience do we have that would uh, you'd want to engage in a dialogue with the individual so that they would see that you actually do understand that. 
um, I, I share often that again in that job description when they say oh requirements are these things again if you're ticking it off and saying oh shoot I don't have that I can't apply um, that's not actually true that's a proxy for people who have done that probably have experience in being able to do this thing so you're able if you're able to show them that in fact this thing that's really important to the success in the role um, I, I have done things similarly over in these other places. Um, that's a story and that's kind of what I was talking about also in the summary statement where we're um, layering and leveraging our prior experiences with what's needed in ways that build confidence that you can actually be successful in that place. But again, you need to know what they care about so that you can articulate and craft that story to um, have them leaning and excited that I, 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 I this is non-traditional and I think that this is willing, I'm willing to take a risk here. Um, I think I've gotten through most of the questions and I think we're at the top of the hour. So um, there's a note here that says, thank you for getting us off on a fresh start on a Monday morning. I'm delighted to have spent my Monday morning with you. And for those of you that are watching this as a recording, not on Monday, I'm happy to be with you here too. So any future questions, please, reach back to me, make a coaching appointment, and um, keep your eyes open for future webinars. We have alumni career services webinars scheduled pretty much every month through, through the end of the year. So I'm looking forward to spending some time with you again soon. Thanks so much. Have a great day.